All right, welcome Zia World. Um, let's get started. Uh, let's talk about the motivation for integration tests. Uh, well, unit tests are a good idea, but if you've um, been doing programming distributed systems, you know that uh, nothing gives you greater peace of mind than the integration test. Also, integration tests don't change if the implementation changes, so you can rewrite your code safely. If you don't want to disappoint your user, uh, it's best to test your code as if the user was using it. This idea has been popularized by behavior-driven development promoted by Dan North. So why aren't we all running the right integration test? Well, because they are hard, or at least historically, integration tests were hard to write. However, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It was first revealed to me by two co-founders of London School of TDD, Steve Freeman and Nat Price, in their great book, Growing Object-Oriented Systems Guided by Test. They discussed a number of useful techniques of writing integration tests, but today I'd like to focus on one of them, namely hexagonal architecture. Before going any further, let me quickly tell you about myself. I've been in uh, the industry for over 25 years. I spent almost 20 years in uh, the city of London, designing and implementing software for financial institutions. I'm passionate about good practices and love languages with high abstraction like Scala, Elm, or Unison. I have also presented a dozen of events and conferences and contributed to open source. My biggest contribution was work on Aka Camel. I have also written uh, the first asynchronous Monad-based client for Amazon DynamoDB. Lately, uh, I've been writing algorithms that allow privacy-preserving analysis of data distributed in heterogeneous databases. Okay, let's take a look at the diagram of the hypothetical system that allows the user to run queries that involve multiple data sources. For the purpose of this presentation, the green hexagons in the middle are considered the application layer, the blue ones are external components, and the red ones are considered infrastructure. The dark blue cylinders on the right are external data sources, maybe even hosted in a different cloud. When the user runs a query, the UI sends the message via message pass to the red, the red hat. Um, this message gets picked up by the brain that figures out how to run such a query, and then sends a message to connectivity layer for execution. Connectivity layer talks to the warehouses and sends partial results to the combinator. The combinator merges the data and sends the results back to the user via the message path. Today, we are going to focus on how can we test the application layer, namely the brain, the connectivity, and the combinator combo. Before we talk about the integration test, let's come back for a moment to hexagonal architecture. To cut the long story short, hexagonal architecture simply means that each component has the core of its logic in the center of the component, and it talks to its peer components via an adapter layer. This means that we can easily test each component by substituting its peers adapters with fakes or simplified versions. The main enabler for the integration testing is the fractal architecture or fractal nature of the hexagonal architecture. Each component itself can be built from smaller hexagons and those smaller ones can consist of even smaller ones. This way, we can choose an arbitrary level of granularity for our integration tests. We can test one level above unit tests, but we can also test at the multi-service level by composing several services into one test fixture. Let's take a look at some examples. Here, uh, we have the multi-service test, test fixture that combines brain, combinator, and connectivity services. It also stops less important components such as audit or quotas, and it fakes the directory service, which is crucial in testing, but we would like to pre-populate it with test data. We are also pushing out the auxiliary platform services and message bus to the Docker container, so we can run them on the developer's machine or on the CI CD node. 
We are keeping the real warehouse to make the testing more realistic, but we will use the test schema and pre-populate it with test data. Another scenario is almost identical to the previous one. Here, we are using the embedded database in order to make the test self-contained and way faster. Okay, let's see how we can implement uh, the integration test in Zeo. This is the level of abstraction I was looking for. It speaks in the language of the user and it is flexible enough so I can provide different instances of the test fixture, depending on which scenario I would like to test. I can also provide test data, so my test is self-contained and isolated from other tests. In the top example, I want to run the test against the real database, so I just use the same test spec and provide the fixture that talks to the database. In the bottom example, I prefer to use the embedded database for speed. For example, I can run the embedded one continuously on the developer's machine on every change in the code base, but I want to run the test against the real database on the continuous integration server or before I push my changes to the repo. Let's take a look at the brain service. It's minimal. It only reads the config and passes it on to the brain class. It is designed this way so we can easily instantiate the brain class in other contexts, such as test fixture. But we can also imagine running multiple services on one JVM to reduce the resource consumption or to reduce the complexity of the deployment process. Remember the EJVs? I feel that the idea was sound in principle. What do you think? It is worth noting that our service is a daemon and it listens for events. Therefore, the run method does nothing. The subscription happens during the initialization of the brain layer. Brain component slash hexagon is just a normal class and it gets its dependencies through the constructor. This is a conscious choice to avoid using the Zio environment for dependencies and to leave the environment with that for the local context. As explained by Eagle and Yaroslav in their brilliant talk earlier today, overusing the R type variable for dependencies is a typical newbie move. It leads to a lot of trouble down the line. Remember the Spring Framework unwieldy dependency mesh? If you read the Zeo docs thoroughly, you'll see that authors clearly discourage using R for dependencies. But since I skimmed over the docs myself, I wanted to save you a lot of time and frustration. I would also like to thank Adam Varsky for bringing this issue up with John the Ghost and getting it clarified once and for all. Now let's move to the config. Again, it was the conscious choice not to make the config part of the implicit dependencies as we wanted to control which hexagon uses which bit of the configuration precisely. So we can safely instantiate each of them independently, knowing exactly what setting they need to run. That's why each hexagon has the config case class in its own namespace. For example, messagepath.config or directory.config. And finally, we are using the familiar SCADA apply method as a smart constructor for the layer. It feels neater that way than calling it a layer. Since we are 100% in Zeo, so the layer is just a smart way of constructing things. That's what apply method is for, isn't it? Here is how we construct a test fixture. We have a smart constructors creating message path client, detecting the Docker port, and the in-memory directory service with some test data. The message bus is shared amongst brain, combinator, connectivity service, and a test fixture. There is a neater way of constructing layers. The make macro will figure out what depends on what, so you only need to list all the dependencies. 
It's convenient. But remember the spring framework grant? I'm worried that if the list gets too long, it might get out of hand and hinder the fractal nature of the system. What do you think? And here is the smart constructor for the in-memory brain service. Since we want to fake the directory service and possibly message bus, that in-memory layer requires those dependency. Look like the fractal, fractal nature of our system clearly shows in this example. Finally, I'd like to show you the part of Zio framework that makes me smile. I love how much expression power does it have. Let's take a look at the subscribe to events method. The bus is a pop stop. When we subscribe, we get the Z stream of messages. Then we add a safety mechanism in case the connection stalled to kill the stream. If we don't get any message within some time, this is a really effective technique of building self-healing systems. Then we are making the stream invincible by asking it to retry forever, but with exponential backoff that doesn't go about three seconds. Eventually for each method, we do some work and ignore the errors because we don't want to stop the service if we can't process one message. By the way, ignore logs wasn't working in early version of ZO2 and fixing it made me an official contributor to the ZO framework. Okay. Then we run the stream forever and make sure that we get something in the logs when it shuts down. Finally, fork scope ties the shutdown of this fiber to the external scope. So our subscription can be cleanly shut down when we no longer need it and decide to close the scope. This is useful in a test fixture. We just define the scope around a single test or if we want to use the subscription reuse the subscription, the scope can go around the entire test suite or even wider around the entire test class. It can be also useful in scenarios where we want to restart the service to some reason. Remember the subscribe method from previous slides? This is how we take the layer that creates brain class and convert it to a scope layer that starts the subscription. As long as this layer is alive, the subscription is active. When the layers, layer is disposed of, the scope will be closed, and this will trigger shutting down the forked fiber that runs the message pass screen. This is all for today. Slides from this presentation are, the presentation are available on speaker deck. The code is on GitHub. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And if you'd like to work with me on distributed systems using Zio, please drop me a line. Thank you. It was a pleasure.